glad you could join us for the Eternity Online Service. It's always good to know that you're out there, we're here, God's with you, He's with us, He's all around us, and we can seek Him, we can invest time with Him today and really experience God and receive from Him all at the same time. God loves you and He wants to do something in your life today. So let's praise Him together with everything we've got. Yes.
time to open our hearts as we've given him the glory and the praise. He wants to touch you right now by the power of his spirit. It's time to pray. Let's pray. Father, as we open our hearts in prayer, we are asking that right now by your spirit, you would visit every person yes. that watches this, that's participating, that you would visit us here in this room right now and allow us together to come into agreement around things that you want to minister to, around things that need to be changed and fixed, mm -hmm. and for many people to be healed right now in Jesus' name. So many people still feeling so unsettled. Mm -hmm. I pray that you would receive his peace today. Amen. Amen. Receive his peace. Receive the power of God coming on you today. Mm -hmm. He is peace. He is healing. He is love. He is the glory of God. Just let that power and that glory just come all over you from the top of your head flowing down like it says in the Bible, like the oil that was poured on Aaron and flowed down over his beard and over his garments. Let that supernatural anointing come on you right now and you will find that he is a God of love. He loves you. And if there's any sin in your life, that is bothering your conscience right now. It's just a matter of asking for forgiveness, really admitting it, confessing it, and then absolutely forgetting it and moving forward as though sin never existed because that's what it means to be the righteousness of God in Him and to walk in to where we have free and open access to come to the very throne room of God in Jesus' name. It's time to continue to put our trust in him. We stand against all fear in mm. Jesus' name. Fear, leave in the name of Jesus. Father, we put our faith and our trust in you. Anybody with COVID symptoms, we rebuke mm. those symptoms in Jesus' name, command them to leave the body of Christ, leave the people of God, and to leave everybody in the sound of my voice right now. And anybody with side effects from the injection, Anybody with bad effects in any part of their life, we command that also to go for it to be healed and that there be no further complications yes, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Let it be. Liver, be healed in the name of mm. Jesus. We pray for restoration of the liver in Jesus' name. No more blood clots. We command all those clots to begin to dissolve and to go out of people's lives yeah. right now. And Father, today I want to pray for those who have the call of God and know they're called from God, but they're tangled up in the affairs of civilian life, so to speak. And I pray for them today, Father, that you would show them step by step mm. how they can move forward, how they can get free of what they see as impossible, binding situations and encumbrances and how to walk free so they can fulfill the God-given call of God upon their life. Be freed today. And you devils that are trying to hold people back, we bind you, we loose you from the grip of those devils and we set you absolutely free right now. Be freed, your eyes open, seeing the call of God and seeing how to walk in it in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord, give them a vision of the great things that you have for them. Father, that they can be released into all that you have for their life. Father, give them that vision. Open their eyes to the good things you have for them and that you will provide as they step into it. In Jesus' name. And I say today, tongues be loosed in Jesus' name. Where the fear of rejection has held you back, where fear has held you back, I loose your tongue right now to be a witness, mm -hmm. to be somebody who's ready to open their mouth and explain the reason for the hope that's in them and that they're not alone, that they stand for Jesus. Amen. Oh, let them be released into full potential oh, in Jesus' yes, Lord. name. There's someone watching today and listening, and there have been many times where you've had that beckoning nudge of the Spirit of God prompting you, calling you, sell what you have, give the money to the poor, come follow me. And today God is saying it again, loud and clearly through me, sell what you have, give the money to the poor, free yourself and come follow me, says Jesus, and I will make you into a fisher of men. I will make you competent in the ministry to which I've called you to walk in. 
Give it all over to me. Cast the care in me, says the Lord, and trust me. God will provide your every need. As we sow into his kingdom, he gives back abundantly. Amen. Amen. Multiplied in Jesus' name. He's the multiplier of the seeds we sow. No doubt about that. Yeah. That's his covenant with us. He blesses us and multiplies our seeds. We certainly can attest to that. Thank you, Lord. Well, God bless you today. Let's open our hearts in worship. Yeah. Let's really allow the Spirit of God full access as we surrender in worship to what he wants from us. Remember, our heart attitude is that of Jesus. Not my will, but yours be done. Yeah. Let's continue to receive fresh vision and everything that he has for us, healing, wisdom, and all that you need as you worship him today.
Mountain Moving Mindset. We are now well into 2022 and it is time to come alive to the new things that God has for us and mindfully move some mountains. For some, we have to revive what we have put aside. For others, it's time to change our mindset to one of thriving in what we have been put on this earth to do and not just surviving. It's time to make sure our mindset is one of positioning ourselves to fight through every situation we may face. If our perspective has shifted because of all that has happened and is continuing to happen, then it is time to realign and posture ourselves to move forward. Yes, our God is with us in our lives. He has the throne. Everything is possible with Him when not alone. He makes a way when all seems hopeless in our sight. He gives Choose to see an eternal perspective, how God sees things. We have to live in His truth, not in a perspective that has been distorted by the world's perspective dictated to us by media and people with their own agenda. It is time to readjust negative thought patterns that may have crept in. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We have the ability to utterly rewire and transform our mind, which is where the turnaround starts. Don't be conformed to a godless system but become a living sacrifice and be transformed by a renewed mind, committed to the ideals of the kingdom of God. When our mind is transformed, we are transformed. We are meant to live in wholeness, to live life to the full. Obviously, if our mind has distorted thought patterns, our actions follow. You can't think one way and act another. They are connected. If you feel defeated, you will live defeated but you have the mind of Christ. You are not a victim of your thoughts. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says to take our thoughts captive, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We are to pull down the strongholds that try to lodge in our mind as true. They may seem true, but they are not truth. They are based on a lie. Sometimes there's giants in the land Trying to kill, steal and destroy In Jesus' name we make a stand We make a stand
behind every lie is fear. Fear comes from not believing in the promises and provisions of God that are ours through Jesus Christ. To pull down a lie, we have to replace it with the truth of His Word and with the powerful name of Jesus. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The war is in your heart. We've been given spiritual weapons. Put on the whole armour of God in order to stand strong against the forces of hell. And then do battle with prayer. God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. The enemy comes to steal, to kill and to destroy, but Jesus came that you would have life and have it to the full, an abundant life. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Let's mindfully move mountains.
Greatest revival ever. This is part five, walking with Jesus. The foundational scripture for this whole series is Mark 1 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And it's actually the whole of Mark chapter 1, from which we get these different steps, stages, or parts of this great revival, which is seen through Jesus' visitation. The foundational scripture for part five is found in Mark chapter 1 verses 16 to 20. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. Let's pray. Father, we pray today as we open your word, as we devote our time to the word of God today, that you would open the eyes of our understanding, give us revelation from heaven about Jesus, about the word of God, and about what you've put here for us for all eternity, the picture of the greatest revival ever, and that we would see not only what's here, but how it applies to our lives. And Father, today we're here to find the grace we need to help us apply this and to live it and to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, today's theme, how do we see the great revival here now? Part five today walking with Jesus. I'm going to read Matthew's account. This is Matthew 4, 18 to 22. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, throwing a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Come on, follow me, and I will make you competent at fishing for men. Immediately they left the nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, mending the nets, and he called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. I often wonder how he felt about it. That is Zebedee. So Jesus' call obviously eclipsed everything else. And I believe as we look at this passage and other issues that surround it and as it's expanded in other places in the Bible, and we give our attention, we're going to see how this fits in to this theme. We're going to see exactly how it worked in the visitation of Jesus and how it went on from there as he multiplied his ministry through his 12 apprentices. But we'll also see how to apply it. So I want to encourage, give yourself over to this and be ready to receive. On part five, walking with Jesus. So after heeding the prophetic word, surrendering and worship to Father's will, after overcoming the enemy in your wilderness when you stare down your own demons, after returning in power and after becoming a witness to Jesus and his truth, start walking with Jesus. 
Point number one today is become Jesus' apprentice. Number two, become a living word student. And number three, become a disciple maker yourself. So number one, become Jesus' apprentice. Walking with him, yoked to him in close submitted fellowship and discipleship. So the first sub point here is A, they were busy, productive people. That's who Jesus called. He didn't call the idle. He didn't call those with plenty of time on their hands. He called busy fishermen in gainful employment. Now, you might be in a situation in your life where you're retired or you can't work or you're a shut in. But maybe you are working at the moment. Maybe you have full time work and you contemplate full time ministry. And I'm speaking to someone right now. You've contemplated full-time ministry and you don't see how you could do it because you really need your job, you need the income, you've got to provide for your family or meet your needs. But God is saying to you today, I am bigger than that. And we can see from this scripture that Jesus' call was far greater than this. We know Peter had a wife because they spoke to Peter's mother-in-law. Amen. In the same chapter. We know that James and John were in a family business with their father because they left him in the boat. He was probably hoping that, well, if this doesn't work out, that James takes on the business, I've got John. And if John doesn't take it, I've got James. But both of them walked off to follow the call of God. That's hard on a father, amen? But Jesus' call comes first. And when we stand before him, because we all have to give an account for the things done in the body, we will have to give an account for what he has said to us. And if he says to us, follow me, be like Matthew, Levi, says he just arose, left everything and followed. He was gainfully employed too, very gainfully. He was a tax collector. So let's be like these disciples who immediately left everything to follow Jesus. So point B, the Lord Jesus Christ offered them a learning contract. I love this because I was a trainer. I was the principal of a college. And in that college, I had to interview the students before they started, gave them the whole list of things, which I'm sure they weren't interested in, gave them a great big thick student manual. But I had to explain to them, we have a learning contract. If you pay the fees and if you turn up in the class, We will do everything we can, everything that's necessary for you to become competent. We will even set assessment tasks. And when you put them in, we will assess them and do everything we can to get you to competence. But we cannot make you competent. That's what's so amazing about this verse to me. Jesus gave them one condition. Follow me. Walk with me, be yoked to me, and I will make you competent. This is something we could never have promised. But Jesus can promise it to you. If you trust me with your life, I will make you competent at what I've called and gifted you to be and do at any stage of your life. And remember, that anointing can change from season to season in different parts of your life. Jesus will make you competent at what he's called you to be and do in this next season. So put your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith. Walk with him, focus on him, and you will be made competent. Now, as we go through the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus explained this more clearly as he went. In Matthew eleven twenty seven, in the Passion Translation, you have entrusted me with all that you are and all that you have. No one fully and intimately knows the Son except the Father, And no one fully and intimately knows the Father except the Son. But the Son is able to unveil the Father to anyone he chooses. Very important that. Now I'm going to read this again, starting from verse 27 and continue on back in the New King James. 
Now all things have been delivered to be by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. This is about revelation. Jesus can reveal the Father to you, and he will, but he goes on in the next verse and gives conditions, or he gives the strategy, or he gives the way you do this, the process. Verse 28, come to me. You know, the Son can reveal the Father, so come to me, Jesus said, all you who labor and are heavy laden, they don't have a revelation of the Father's love and what he's really like. And I will give you rest. That's a revelation of the Father. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. This is something we have to understand. Jesus has a yoke. That's how we learn from him. It's like in the old days when they used to plow with two oxen or a yoke of oxen, as they'd call it, the experienced animal. They put the yoke across its neck onto the inexperienced animal. And as they were doing the work, the inexperienced one was learning from the experienced one. Now, it's interesting. Jesus did take his disciples aside and give them some classroom teaching. That's found in Matthew's chapter 5, 6 and 7. And other places, Jesus taught them on the roadside, just like an apprentice chef has to go off to the classroom for instruction at times. We all have to have some instruction. But I don't see two bullocks out in the field plowing a paddock and the new one doesn't get it right and they stop everything. And the old bullock takes him aside, sits him down and get out a pen and paper and explains and draws a few diagrams. When you get to the end of the row, you've got to turn around and go back the other way. <laughs> He has to learn by doing it. And this is part of discipleship that goes beyond book learning. It's not just a paper apprenticeship. It's on the job training. And we do this when Jesus says, follow me by being yoked to him. It's an inner relationship that begins when we repent and get born again. When you repent, and you have to throw yourself completely on his mercy for forgiveness as when you start that kind of relationship we're talking about. If you're still living by pride and you say, oh, I'm perfect, I don't need to repent, I'm still fine, I'm holy, everything's good, then you don't have that kind of relationship where you lean the whole of your being on Jesus. This is what he's talking about. Come to me. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, he says. I'm gentle and lowly in heart. He's saying he's not proud, he's humble, he's gentle. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. The only way to know God is if Jesus reveals him. Jesus then said he would do this if we take his yoke upon us, become a fully submitted trainee or apprentice. Amen. I keep using the word apprentice because that's both some classroom learning and a lot of on the job training. Amen. The Passion Translation of this says, come and follow me and I'll transform you into men who catch people for God. I remember talking to a street kid once who had grown up in Sunday school and she goes, oh, I remember one song we used to sing, Fishes of Men. And she started singing this old song. And I said, what does it mean? She goes, I don't know. That's just what we sang. And so if I say, Jesus said, I'll make you fishes of men. Even when I was a kid, I thought, well, what, are we going to grow fins and a tail and have scales and be better at swimming underwater? What does it mean, fishes of men? So this one explains it. I'll transform you into men who can catch people for God. The fourth Sub point is that they responded immediately. Notice that? Come on, follow me. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Matthew 4, 22. Immediately, speaking of James and John, they left the boat and their father and followed him. When Elijah threw the mantle over Elisha in the Old Testament, he didn't finish the day plowing. Immediately 
he sacrificed the oxen, he burned up his plow, and then he dropped everything and went off to follow Jesus. You could say that Elisha immediately burned his bridges and followed Elijah. Because remember, Jesus said in the New Testament, if you put your hand on the plow and even look back, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. So it's an all or nothing. Respond to the call of Jesus. The second illustration goes back to Elisha and Elijah. Elijah walked past and threw his mantle on him, but the exchange didn't take place then. It was a prophetic action of what God was going to do in the spirit. God was going to take the mantle that was on Elijah's life spiritually and transfer it to Elisha. Now, we know that Elisha didn't keep the mantle at that point because when Elijah went up in the whirlwind, then the mantle fell down to Elisha. That's when Elisha took it completely. But in between, there was a period of overlap, like the runners in a relay where one is running and he gets ready to pass the baton to the other one in the overlap section. And so this transfer took place between Elijah and Elisha during the time that Elisha served him. And we see this in 2 Kings chapter 3, verses 11 to 12, where King Jehoshaphat was with the king of Israel. And Jehoshaphat asked him, have you got a prophet here that can give us a word from God? And he goes, oh, I've got a stack of prophets. And he goes, but are there any prophets of the Lord? I'm reading here from 2 Kings chapter 3, verses 11 to 12. But Jehoshaphat said, is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat's here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. He was serving as a menial servant, getting him a cup of coffee, washing his feet or his hands. Amen. Washing his car when it needed washed, coming in and mowing the lawn at the church, doing the menial things. So King Jehoshaphat said straight away, the word of the Lord is with him. So he knew that if he was there as the servant of the prophet, what was on the prophet would come on him. So when you serve the ministry that God has put in your life, don't look at the person. Amen. Listen to the word of God and look at the anointing. So what can we see about the great revival here now? We're talking about walking with Jesus. So number one, become Jesus' apprentice, walking with him, yoked to him in close submitted fellowship and discipleship, become his apprentice, sit with the Bible, do it regularly. Goodness, I'm a student. I love learning off the book and out of books and on the computer. But we need also to walk with Jesus in our family, at our workplace, in our education, with our spouse. We need to walk with Jesus when we're out amongst the crowd, when we're doing an outreach, no matter where we are. Because remember, Rosanna and I have a saying, someone's always watching. And if it's not somebody who knows who you are physically, it's certainly angels and the Holy Spirit. And we have to give an account for our words and for our actions. Someone's always watching. So remember, you've got to keep in step with Jesus by walking in the spirit, living by faith, being fervent in love, laying your life down, denying self all the time. Amen. Number two today become a living word student, walking with Jesus in his word. See, this is also very important. I've got this scripture here for this, which is John chapter 8, verses 31 to 32. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. If you abide in me, he said in one place, and my word abides in you, you are my disciples and you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. We need to be in the word of God. 
And I've been saying this for 10 years or more. We need to eat the word, sleep the word, think the word, say the word, preach the word, pray the word, study the word, analyze the word, memorize the word. You can sing it, shout it, say it and pray it. There's lots of ways to declare it, but we need to walk in the truth of the word. We need to live the word. And like I said, don't be a hearer only, but be a doer of the word of God so that as we receive revelation, not only does that word come and test us, but we need to apply that word as we go. We need to apply it. So every time we're worshiping now, we need to be yielding and surrendering. We need to be fighting off devils with the word of God. We need to be giving witness. And now we need to be walking with him all the time as diligent apprentices. Not nine to five only. Amen. Not Sunday morning, 10 a.m. to midday, but 24 seven living in tight relationship in lockstep with Jesus. Yoke to him. Remember, his yoke is easy. His burden is light. If you're carrying something that's not easy and it's not light, it's not from Jesus. He does have a yoke. He does have a burden. But like he said, it's light and easy. Amen. And that's not a slogan for a company. It's from the Bible. So an illustration of this is when Paul first met Jesus on the road to Damascus. He went into Damascus and then he went into the wilderness of Arabia because Paul was a Pharisee. He would have known that Bible, the Old Testament, back to front. Probably as he was a child growing, he could probably quote huge sections of it knew it all and he was a bit of a student because I remember he wrote to one of his disciples later and said bring the parchments he was out there in Arabia with God receiving revelation he was a book learner but he was an applier of the word as well amen he was a practitioner not a theorist only amen and so after he'd been out there he came back he did some things and he says after three years I went to Jerusalem From my reading, he was there for quite a while and he gave himself over, a bit like going to Bible college. So how can we see the great revival here now? We need to become Jesus' apprentices. And number two, we need to become a living word student. You know, study the word till it comes alive in you and let it overflow into others. And number three, become a disciple maker, walking with Jesus by imitating his apprenticeship model. So in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in both heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples. In Greek, it's be a teacher, teach all the nations. So making a disciple and teaching them. But remember, it's not just book learning. It's being yoked. It's on the job training, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. We have to show people the commands of Jesus and not legalisms. That's a living person giving us instructions And we need to follow him by doing what he says and going where he goes. Amen. And he says, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So sub point A here is Jesus graduating apostles themselves took on apprentices. We see this in Acts 2.42, then 46 to 47 in obedience to Jesus command here. So. Acts 2.42 starts like this, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. How did they know what the apostles' doctrine was? The apostles were teaching it to them, but they were in fellowship together. You know, it's this, come follow me, take my yoke, be with me. Sub point B, Paul took on Timothy as a disciple. Acts 16.1 to 5 reveals this. Paul came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, a son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren. So in other words, he had character that people could testify to. 
He was the genuine. Verse 3 says, Paul wanted to have him go on with him. In other words, Paul saying to Timothy, come on, follow me, walk with me, come with me. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews of that region, for they knew his father was a Greek. And they together went through the cities. They delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles. So there's a chain of command. Jesus gave decrees to the apostles. Paul took that. He went and started to give that out. Timothy was with him, learning as they went. Later he wrote to Timothy and said, To Timothy, a true son in the faith. 2 Timothy, to Timothy, a beloved son. So I know we're not supposed to call any man father, but Paul said, I became a father in the spirit because I taught you my values, my way of life. I opened my heart like Jesus with his father. The father revealed things. Paul revealed things to Timothy about ministry, about walking with Jesus so that Timothy was able to learn. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18, we see that Paul sent another of his disciples called Titus. Listen to what he says about him. I urged Titus and sent our brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Rhetorical question. Did we not walk in the same spirit? Did we not walk in the same steps? Paul could say this about Titus because he knew that there'd been a successful transfer of not only the anointing to do the ministry, but the heart, the character, the values, and the personality of Jesus in him, so that when Titus went there, Paul knew exactly how he would behave himself. And so he sent him as a representative of himself. And remember, Paul said, follow me as I follow Jesus. So sometimes leadership is used in bringing us into the image of Jesus. Otherwise, Paul couldn't have said that. Paul would have said, don't look at me, just keep your eyes on Jesus, I'm in the background. He said, you imitate me as I imitate Jesus. So we must all understand this. Disciples, teachers, trainers, and leaders have been put into the body of Christ you know, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers for the equipping of the saints so that the saints can do what they need to do. Amen. Subpoint D, we're talking about an application of this, which is discipleship slash apprenticeship now. And we need to use Jesus' method. And his method went like this. And remember, I've got a nine book series on exactly this. It's the big title is Lead. And it goes through the whole of the book of Matthew with bits and pieces from the other Gospels. The whole of the Gospels showing Jesus as a trainer of apprentices. And I thoroughly recommend it to you. You can find it on online sellers. The best one for my sake is Lulu. Jesus method, you watch me. Number two, we do it together. Number three, I watch you. When I assess that you are competent, I release you to Jesus' call and you walk with Jesus as Lord. But remember, Paul never stopped giving advice to Timothy. Amen. So think like someone training somebody else how to bake a cake or how to do some work in the garage if it's a man with his son or something like that. So a woman might say to her daughter, right, this is how you do this. You know, it can be a father training a daughter in the garage and a mother training a son or not being gender specific. But you watch me. You know, when I was a little boy, I used to watch my mum all the time. She used to cook tea. And one night, mum and dad weren't home. And I just said, how hard can it be? I've watched this a few times. And I just went ahead and did what she did. Amen. She'd train me without actually training me. But when I worked with my father, I learned how to milk a cow by milking a cow with him. He showed me how you do it, especially milking by hand. That's not easy. He'd show you how to do it. You try, it doesn't work. He explained it a bit more, he tried again, but there was that hands-on learning as we went. And then he trained me how to work with a cattle dog. And that was one of the greatest lessons of my life because I thought it was about wielding authority and commanding the dog to do things. But he showed me, you've got to get the dog to think it's having fun. And he showed me how to do it. I was too proud to do it straight away, but I had to humble myself 
and learn to do what he did. And then the dog would round up the cows because it thought it was having fun. It didn't think it was getting told off for doing something naughty. Amen. So we need to do that. You watch me. We do it together. I watch you. When I assess that you're competent, I release you. And then we can both train somebody else. Amen. I need to ask you some questions. Have you already taken on the yoke of Jesus? Have you taken up the call to learn from the Word of God and to live what you're learning? And have you also so full of the Word of God that you can't help but to disciple others because it just overflows? Amen. And of course, mixed into that is when you're taking the Word of God, you've got to exercise your faith, live by love, deal with things, sort things out. Amen. So in conclusion, how do we see the great revival here now? We've been talking about walking with Jesus, which is discipleship, apprenticeship. It's a love relationship. It's following Jesus and it's worshiping him and his father all the time. So after heeding the prophetic warning, surrendering in worship to father's will, overcoming the enemy in your wilderness, returning in power, and after beginning to be a witness, number one, become Jesus' apprentice, walking with him, yoked to him in close, submitted fellowship and discipleship. There's a lot of love there, but there's also a learning and a correcting that needs to take place. Number two, become a living word student, not a dry, lifeless word, because remember Paul said, the letter can kill, but the Spirit gives life. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. So it's walking with Jesus in his word, being submitted to that word as you read it. And number three, become a disciple maker, walking with Jesus by imitating his apprenticeship model. He will apprentice you in how to be the perfect trainer for those that are coming to you for apprenticeship, amen? And gradually you shift that umbilical cord from yourself to them until they can walk under his anointing. You'll always be there like a parent in the background when they need help and are open to it, you can give help. But there comes a day when you release your disciples to do what God's calling them to do, amen? So put on the yoke today. Dedicate to growing in the word till it comes alive in you. Believe that God will bring someone for you to give overflow to. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray for all of the viewers today that you would do exactly this for them. That as they learn, that you would give them someone to release what they're learning today on someone else. That they can talk to someone, write it down, talk on the phone, visit with someone, have a group, whatever stage they're at, wherever they are, that someone will come to mind right now and they'll say, I know that this person really needs to hear this. Amen. Now, before we conclude, I've got to ask another question. Have you yet given your life to Jesus? This comes first. We call it getting saved simply because Jesus said, if you give your life over to him, he can rescue you from a certain destiny in a very hot place called hell. H-E double hockey sticks. Hell is real. It's no joke. Jesus spoke about it and it's called being born again. And it's the first step of coming into relationship with Jesus. And remember, Jesus was the one who came up with the phrase born again. It is a very Jesus concept. Today, I encourage you, if you haven't been born again, you might say, I'm not sure. That's like me asking you, have you been married? If you're not sure if you've been married, then obviously you haven't. So if you're not sure, you need to say this prayer. And if you know you haven't been born again, I'm going to lead the prayer right now that can start you on your journey. It's a prayer of accepting Jesus as Lord, turning from your old life, believing that God raised him from the dead and by the grace of God committing to follow him. So pray this after me. Say this, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you rose from the dead. 
Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my old life. I let go of sin and my old nature. Please forgive me for everything I've done wrong. Today, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Saviour. I confess that you are my Lord. And by the grace of God, I commit to following you as my good shepherd from this day forward. Now I believe I'm born again. The old has passed away. I am now a new creation. And my name is in the Lamb's Book of Life in heaven. I am Jesus' disciple. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, well done. You prayed that prayer today. I believe you're born again. And you need to start talking about it. Get Jesus' word in. Talk about it. If you've got no one to tell, write to us in the comments section or write to us on Facebook or Messenger. Tell us what has happened and we will pray for you and do our best to keep in touch. God bless you. So glad you were with us today. I know that you've all received something. So hold on to that and continue to praise him through the week and we'll see you next week. So for now, from Dave and Rosanna, it's bye. bye.